All right, welcome to Black Hollywood Weekend. We are honored to have a great actress, Miss Karima Westbrook, here with us today for Ebony Magazine. Um, I've known you for a long time, so I know a, a lot of these things, but for our audience, I have to ask you, uh, can you tell us a little about where you're from, where did you grow up, and who were some of your influences? Sure, yes, I grew up in Chicago, uh, born and raised. Uh, growing up, some of my influences, you mean as far as the art or just in life in general? In general. Uh, my mom had a, played a huge, she was a huge, played a, had a huge influence on my life growing up. Uh, she was very strong, determined, you know, uh, worked very hard. And so she really gave me or helped me or inspired my own work ethic. So um, she played a huge part of me, like, never giving up. How did the city of Chicago, like, how does that play into who you are right now? Well, we don't go down without a fight, that's for sure. Uh, I think I really got a lot of my, um, my tough skin, for lack of a better word, living in Chicago, seeing a lot of different things, but definitely the, the drive and um, there's a lot of talent in yeah. Chicago. I love my city. You know, there's a lot happening there, but I think the tough skin, you know, I yeah. got that from the shy. How did you first get into acting? Well, I've been acting ever since I was a kid um, for family to start, like, just entertaining, you know, for my grandmother, my mother, my aunts. And then um, in elementary school, I started doing plays and talent shows. In high school, I kind of got into sports more. And I re didn't really realize that I could pursue acting professionally until like after high school. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg was like a huge influence uh, for me uh, as a kid because she was an actress who looked like me. And uh, I remember just watching all of her films and like, I want to do that. But for some reason, I didn't connect the dots like, you could actually do that like for a living and get paid for it. Yeah. And um, so... As a kid, theater, and then, you know, after high school, I decided to pursue it professionally. So, I mean, when we look back, I mean, Whoopi Goldberg, Whoopi Goldberg has been doing movies, uh, I would say, since the 80s, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. But, and, and she's, and she, she's a finer, darker brown s sister, and you're, mm -hmm. you're a, your skin complexion is, is brown. Did, did, have you, run into because I remember straight out of Compton had some casting or something where it was like hey we want some light skin this and light mm -hmm. skin that when you look at castings is it often complexion um, is complexion off, often an obstacle in casting is it in the description that we don't want you know you would never really know that unless you were on the other side probably mm -hmm. working with the creative team I think people definitely have their types that they want and sometimes in a breakdown, they'll say, we want an Alfred Woodard type, or we want a Whoopi Goldberg type, or we want a Halle Berry type, and then you can kind of get an idea, you know, yeah. of what they're looking for. So um, very rarely have I seen anything that's like, we want a dark-skinned girl, um, unless someone specifically wants, like, a dark-skinned girl, and then they'll make that very clear. Yeah. But normally people kind of stay in a general vein of, like, we want this type. And so, you know, if they want a Halle Berry type type, they're not seeing Karima Westbrook, you know? <laughs> right. um, what would you consider was your, your first big break in Hollywood? My first big break was a movie called Save the Last Dance. I crashed that audition. And uh, we actually, they shot that in Chicago. I was still living in Chicago. And that's actually how I got enough money to pack up and move to L.A. But that was my first big break. I got my SAG card from Save the Last Dance and yeah. You, well, you gotta tell us how you crashed this audition, <laughs> I mean. Well, I knew a girl, a lot of actor, actors and actresses in Chicago and Save the Last Dance had a lot of buzz. Like people were like, oh, I got an audition, I got an audition. And at the time I only had a commercial agent. I didn't have a theatrical agent. And this one girl was saying how she had an audition and I asked her, oh yeah, like, when are you going in? When is your audition, you know? And then she mentioned when she was having the audition and who was casting for it. And I just showed up, you know, on the day. And they were looking for a very specific type for this role. And I stood out like a sore thumb. And the casting director, Claire Simon, she, like, looked around the room and she saw me. And she's like, 
does everybody here have an appointment? So that was like clearly for me. And I was like sinking in my seat. And then I, I went up to her and I was like, I don't have an appointment, but I really want to audition for this. I don't have a theatrical agent. And she let me audition. And then I got a call back and it was this whole thing with my hair because I was wearing my hair natural back then. And they wanted someone with like long hair. Like natural hair was not in back then at all. And um, so I tried to, uh, I put like this weave. I like did a, a sew in. No, 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 I didn't do a sew in. I did a wig because I was like, I don't want to sew any weave in my hair. And I had a wig. And back then wigs were not what they are today. So the wig was probably like three feet off the top of my head. And I went back and I was like, it was very weird. And it was like, eh, this is not really working. But I, did, I, got a call. I went back like three times. And then eventually I met with Thomas Carter, which is the director. And then they gave me another role. But wow. that's how I got a part. And then I got my uh, Taff Hartley. And that's how I was able to join the union as well because I wasn't in the union back then. You were, I'm sure you do, but like, can you take us back to that day when you got the part? Like, how was that feeling? And how did you like, did you call everybody? Like, how was, how was that moment for you getting this first big part? It was big. It was a huge moment for me because it was during a time where I really had set out to like, this is what I want to do. You know, and I did a lot of plays in Chicago, community plays, local plays, and um, I had went to the Academy of Dramatic Arts, and I had already, I did a, a, there's a conservatory in Pasadena, and I did their summer program. And so when I came back to Chicago, I was like, I got to get back to L.A. And so I was very focused. I had written out my goals. I was just so driven back then, and so I felt like it was a confirmation, and it was an answer to my prayer, and so I was very, very excited, and then icing on the cake was that I made enough money that I was able to actually move to LA. So it was almost like, you know, um, I feel like God was leading me, you know, and uh, things just, you know, it wasn't, nothing was a coincidence, you know, I just things started to happen, fall into line for me to end up in LA. Mm -hmm. um, has the industry actually changed as much as we believe as far as people of color being equally recognized for their talents? Oh my God, yes. People of color are definitely being recognized. I mean, doors are opening. People are creating their own opportunities. People are kicking down doors. I mean, it's, it's such a good time in Hollywood or just in the entertainment industry um, if you're black, yeah. you know? We're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that sounds so crazy, but it's kind of like, Truth be told, we've always been in, but it's kind of like, you know, we're just, it's, it's um, you know, artists actually imitating life now. You know, before we only had one image of ourselves or maybe two images of ourselves, certain characters being portrayed or people only having the opportunity to work in certain capacities within the industry. Now it's like, no, you, you know, all type of stories are being, are being told. We have uh, African-American uh, leading ladies starring on, on television shows, you know, before we had Diane Carroll or we had um, uh, Ter Teresa uh, Graves uh, or we had, I forget the, the, the woman who won the first Emmy, uh, I forget her name, <coughs> but, but that was very far and few in between, you know, and so it's definitely changed. I'm so happy about that. <coughs> Sorry. It's, it's okay. You okay? Need some water? <coughs> I'm alright. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll be able to edit this anyway, so don't worry about it. Okay. All right. Um. So a few years back, we, you know, a, a lot of people were hashtagging and bringing attention to the Oscar selection with the hashtag Oscar So White. Mm-hmm. Did that movement make a huge difference in Hollywood? Do you? I'm not for sure if the Oscars so white <laughs> made a difference. It definitely um, brought attention to um, the Oscars being so white. So perhaps you know certain powers that be felt like okay, acknowledged it because sometimes things go on for so long the same way that no one even really considers like oh it is this has been this way for so long. Maybe we should make a change. Perhaps, I mean, I see a lot more um, people of color becoming members of the Academy. So maybe it did, you know, um, <coughs> make some sort of impact. 
and this year, and well, from last year, but even bleeding into this year, uh, the conversation, a lot of the conversation is going around the Me Too movement mm -hmm. uh, with perpetrators and victims being uh, a lot of them coming from Hollywood and the acting and executive uh, suite. So, mm -hmm. how uh, the question is, how can uh, men um, better advocate for women? getting fair pay and being treated fairly on set, in your opinion? I think men can become advocates by joining the conversation. I think that if you witness something that you feel is unjust, or you can definitely see the inequality in the situation as far as pay, then say something about it. You know, I think um, I really have a lot of respect for Terry Crews because he shared his um, own experiences that um, related to the Me Too movement with women and it kind of, not saying that with the women speaking up it didn't you know have an impact but I think it just really brought to light of how real um, these situations are and how it affects everyone. So I think it's just a matter of someone having the courage or the empathy to want to speak up and feel like and feel like it is unjust, and um, she should be paid the same. Have you ever witnessed or experienced any harassment on set? And if so, like, no, 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 no. Okay. Let me wait. Let me think now. <laughs> no, that would be awful. But no, no, yeah. no, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last year, I mean, with the last couple of years, I've also seen the rise of a lot of, a lot of young black creators. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember me growing up, it was like Spike and John Singleton and Robert Townsend, not many, but now today there's a new crop with Donald Glover being a creator, with mm -hmm. Issa Rae being a creator, with mm -hmm. Lena Waithe and, uh, you know, all these people. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, are there any creators that, um, any of these young creators that you're looking at that you really want to work with? And, and All of them. <laughs> uh, Donald Glover, Lena, Issa. I mean, there's so many. I just, I'm inspired by their, uh, their work ethic, their courage, and um, just getting it done. And I like a lot of the stuff that they're doing, everything that they're doing, really. Um, I respect them very much, and it'll be fantastic to, to work with them. Have you seen more black executives um, since you had your big break to now? Like, have you seen more black decision makers and executives uh, in Hollywood than there was back then? Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Definitely, I see a lot more black executives now than I I did back then. But yeah, and I'm I'm sure that is like really the case as far as there there's actually more black executives now. But I feel like now, you know, with social media, and you just exposed to a lot more now as well. But um, despite that, I I think that that transition has actually happened where there's more black people in executive roles within the industry. Speaking of social media, well, not necessarily social media, but mm -hmm. um, this new age of television and movies includes uh, streaming services and mm -hmm. this year's Emmy nominations for the first time and I don't know how long um, HBO was upset by not not by a network but by a streaming network mm -hmm. with Netflix and um, how is uh, Netflix added to um, the diversity of content that's available or the, the opportunities uh, for diverse content. How has Netflix added to that mix? Netflix think? has added to it in a major positive way. Uh, I think it's fantastic what they're doing over there. I mean, it just it's another great outlet for creators to house their um, material. I think it's I think it's great what's happening right now with Netflix. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we are in an era where talents are not bound to one platform. Oh, we just answered that, scratch that. Um, what would you say are wordy topics of conversations you feel has yet to be addressed 
uh, has yet to be brought into, onto television and film and need to be addressed? What topics do I feel that needs to be addressed? As far as storytelling? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I would like to see something around, like, health and wellness. I mean, you can probably find uh, things like that on, like, YouTube or if you really kind of search, but, like, something on broadcast television where it's exposed to the, to the masses, uh, something that's done in a, a maybe entertaining way or thought-provoking way, but just something that is educating people in regards to that matter because there's so many people now that's sick. And I think that if we had something that um, could educate people but also entertain them, I think that that would be a nice little uh, twist in the mix of all the other things that we have on television right now. Okay. Um, your, uh, well, well, in your career, I've met you on the set of Truth Hall and seeing your career, uh, you know, blow up on, on all these uh, movies and, and projects. And, and now you're on uh, All American. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little about that project and, um, What's going on with that? <laughs> All American is a, a new drama on the CW network, and it's about um, pro football player Spencer Paysinger. It's inspired by his story. And we basically follow him as he navigates his life of living in South LA and Beverly Hills. He's a, a young football player. We follow him at a, as a teenager, and just him navigating both worlds. And the show is stars Tay Diggs, Daniel Ezra, myself, um, oh God, I'm forgetting everybody else's name. Uh, Breezy, there's a, there's, a, there's a fantastic cast. Uh, the writing is really good. And we actually just started uh, production on it, so. Uh, tell us about your role in, in the film. I play Spencer's mom on the show. My name is Grace James. And basically, I'm positioning him for the best opportunities in life so he can succeed. It's, um, I have two kids on the show. It's Spencer and Dylan. When you, when you get these, does that mean, uh, my daughter's more busy than me. That's how it is, yeah. teenagers. Um, when you get these roles, like, uh, mm -hmm. This one of Miss James. Like, do do you take all of your instruction from the script, or do you like go do other background research? Like, what's just as the craft of acting? Like, how do you approach a new role when you when you get it? Well, it depends on the role. I think as a mother, I I mean, I feel like I am a mother, although I don't have any kids. But my heart is in the place of wanting kids to do well in general, and and that is my a desire for my kids on the show. Um, it depends on the storylines too. A lot of things that, um, I, what I did do on the show because I don't have kids is research a lot of the things that young men um, deal with growing up. Um, also the challenges that mothers have with teenagers and stuff like that. So I definitely do research. That's actually one of the funnest parts of uh, acting for me is just like the collection of information um, and embodying it so I can live live it out truthfully in the role. And um, that you know, the the writers will have the storylines of where they want it to go and depending on what that is, I will have to do internal work to make all of that stuff real for me. Well how do you become that act that character every day that you're on set and then go live your life as Kareem of Westbrook afterwards? Or do you kind of stay connected to that character through the process until the whole thing is over? Like, how is, how do you separate the two when you're... I was, I was gonna say, well, there, there's really no separation because in every role, you, you have your soul. That's what you're working with. That's, that's all that you have. So you're using different aspects of yourself and you're making um, realities that are written your reality. And so it's, it's not, um, you step into different worlds as an actor and then you have to work in a way 
and this is outside of you know this is outside of being on set where you you're making everything real for you and that's like imagination you know concentration um, and there's a lot of tools and things like that that people use as well but I, I guess just on a basic level um, and everybody has a different way of working I you know imagination is like the strongest for me because the the biggest thing is just to to live truthfully and you just have to make those circumstances and that world real real for you and you know once that's real for you you can live out anything yeah. you know you could be you know a murderer and people are like I would never murder anybody but you've you've killed a fly before didn't you you know yeah. <laughs> it's like I mean that's extreme but you know you you have it in you to like kill something yeah. you know and so it's just a matter of like slowing down and really, you know, like I said, everyone has different tools that they use, but imagination is going to be the biggest thing. And, you know, bottom line, it has to be, you have to work in a way where it becomes uh, true for you. It becomes your reality and then yeah. you can live it out. So. Yeah. So, so last year, in fact, I, I know you mostly is doing theatrical film work. And mm -hmm. it's great to see you on the CW show. But last year you was in a Clone Brother film, Suburbicon, that was mm -hmm. getting an Oscar buzz and didn't ultimately get the nominations that I know. it was looking for. But this but but this year there's a lot of buzz around a film that's yet to be seen and and, and it's been produced twice. <laughs> yes. Uh called called Bowden, which you mm -hmm. also <coughs> star in. Um, can you tell us a little about that film and tell the audience a little about like what this film has been through to get oh, to the screen. Oh, yes. Bolden is um, it's a, a labor of love. It's a, it's a really fantastic project. It's, um, it's about the story of Charles Buddy Bolden. He was the man who created the sound of jazz in New Orleans in the late 1800s. I portray his mom. I'm just a mom. I, I'm just... It's something about me. I'm just, I'm like, I was looking, I'm like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm a mom. I am officially a mom. So I play his mom in this film. And basically, he inspired people like Louis Armstrong. And um, the film, we started back in 2006. Now, you say, wow, well, it was 2018. That's a long time. Well, Dan Prisker, he's a bit of a genius. Um, the story started one way. And I think throughout the process, he just was feeling like, you know what, this is not it, you know? And as time went on, because the film initially starred Anthony Mackie, and um, as time went on, and they were, they were supposed to be young boys in the movie, but as time went on, everyone was looking older, the band members were looking older, and then there was like scheduling conflicts, and so Dan had to recast the lead in the, in the film. And, now Buddy Bowden is played by a British actor, Gary Carr, who's fantastic in the role. And um, so we, 2006, and then we stopped, and then we came back in, I think, 2010, and then we stopped, and then we came back in 2014, and then we stopped, and then there was like recastings going on, and then there was a completely different script when Gary Carr came on board, and then like a completely different cast. And um, I came back, Robert Richard came back, and um, I think that's kind of it. Maybe someone else, I might be missing some people, but from the main cast, from the 2006 cast, it was myself and Robert Richard that came back. But it's great, it's a great, um, it's a great film. I, I've, I've had a chance to see it, and I think it's very different. Um, Dick Gregory actually was in one version of the film. Wow. And yeah, yeah, and that was pretty awesome to actually work with him. Um, he's not in the final version, but um, it's really a labor of love, and you can, it's different, it's a different movie because you've never seen black actors uh, working in this particular world and how it's shot and the way the story is told is very unique. I went to a screening and people were like, oh, it's epic, you know, so really, um, moved a lot of people. I mean, I cried, but I think I just cried because I was like, it, it was moving to me because it brought back memories of like, you know, I, I, it, that movie really lived in me. So I felt like that was happening to my son, 
-hmm. And so I was very moved. But I can't wait for people to see it. What is the one piece of advice you would give the upcoming black talent or creator? And, and what's something you wish you would have, you wish you would have told yourself early or if you could go tell your early, yourself early in your career some advice, like what advice would you give the Karima Westbrook that was when it first started, crashing, yeah. crashing the saving the last dance. Yeah, the, the advice I would give myself when I was younger, just starting in the industry is, I, I mean, I've already, I already believed in myself, but one thing that was a big revelation, like hindsight looking back now is that you're gonna go through stuff. And I remember I used to have a lot of pity parties on my journey. I would be like, like straight up giving an Oscar winning performance in my living room. Like, why, Lord, why? I really want that role. You know, I'll be all bent out of shape and feeling like I did something wrong and why isn't it happening sooner? But what I realized is a lot of times you think you're ready for something and you're not, you know, uh, no shade. And there's a lot of things that you have to experience in life to grow as to become what it is that you're seeking. So it's, you're, you are definitely always moving towards what it is that you desire, but there's still life, you know, you still have to grow and develop. And so you're gonna have hardships, you're gonna have growing pains, but that's all a part of the process. It doesn't mean that, it, that's not saying no, that it's not gonna happen. That's not saying that you're, you're not good. That's just, that's just life, that's just growth, that's, that's preparing you to receive the thing that you are. Uh, and that was pretty awesome to actually work with him. Um, he's not in the final version, but um, it's really a labor of love and you can, it's different, it's a different movie because you've never seen black actors uh, working in this particular world and how it's shot and the way the story is told is very unique. I went to a screening and people were like, oh, it's epic, you know. So really um, moved a lot of people. I mean, I cried, but I think I just cried because I was like, it, it was moving to me because it brought back memories of like, you know, I, I, it, that movie really lived in me. So I felt like that was happening to my son. Mm -hmm. And so I was very moved. But I can't wait for people to see it. What is the one piece of advice you would give the upcoming black talent or creator? And, and what's something you wish you would have you wish you would have told yourself early, or if you could go tell your early yourself early in your career some advice, like what advice would you give the Karima Westbrook that was when it first started crashing, yeah. crashing the saving the last dance? Yeah. The the advice I would give myself when I was younger, just starting in the industry, is I, I mean I've already I already believed in myself, but one thing that was a big revelation like hindsight looking back now is that you're going to go through stuff and i remember i used to have a lot of pity parties on my journey i'll be like like straight up giving an oscar winning performance in my living room like why Lord, why i really want that role you know i'll be all bent out of shape and feeling like i did something wrong and why isn't it happening sooner but what i realized is a lot of times you think you're ready for something and you're not you know uh, no shade and there's a lot of things that you have to experience in life to grow as to become what it is that you're seeking. So it's you're you are definitely always moving towards what it is that you desire. But there's still life, you know, you still have to grow and develop. And so you're going to have hardships, you're going to have growing pains, but that's all a part of the process. It doesn't mean that it, that's not saying no, that it's not going to happen. That's not saying that you're you're not good. That's just that's just life. That's just growth. That's that's preparing you to receive the thing that you are. Uh. Good job, Money. Okay. Um, but I think I think we got almost all of that that last answer. But you you were saying that. hard times or just on your journey so on your journey what I would tell myself uh, my younger self is that on your journey you're going to experience hard times you're going to experience growing pains you're gonna you know perhaps want to give up 
But what I learned during, you know, because I, I used to have plenty of pity parties. And, um, but what I've learned is all those things were relative to my development as a person. I don't think I would have been um, emotionally mature enough to perhaps handle all the things that come with the territory of being really visible um, publicly. You know, I, like I said, I've been wanting a television show since I moved out here. 18 years later, I finally have my first series. But I feel like now I'm emotionally mature enough to handle the things that may come with it. And um, so what I would say to upcoming artists and actors is to hold on to your dream. All of those things, those hard times, having to work two jobs, one job or whatever, and feeling like, ugh, when it's gonna happen. But all of that is molding something within you, preparing you to receive this thing that you're asking for. And so I would just say, keep going, keep believing, know that it's gonna happen, know it in your heart, you have to know it in your heart, not in your head, in your heart. And it'll come into fruition, but trust that all those things that happen, it's, it's all relative. And, and lastly, is any uh, final words or thoughts you wanna share with the Ebony audience? I just wanna send blessings to everybody, you know, and to just, you know, um, hope that people just you know keep their heads up during these times I know that there's a lot of negativity in the news right now but you know I believe that there's a lot of great things there's a lot of light happening and so I just you know want to remind people to find the balance you know and um, yeah find the balance and to take care of yourselves and um, just want to wish everybody many blessings moving forward on their journeys Thank you, Ms. Karina Westbrook. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I, this is like, this is major. <laughs>